Hi everyone, here we are, week eight, our uh, last week of the summer semester for History 103. It's also my last day uh, in where I'm currently living in Florida, so I figured I'd broadcast and record these lectures uh, from out of my little back lanai, is what they call them here in Florida, give you a nice little view of the tropical weather here in Naples that I, I get to got to live with for the past year. But uh, anyway, so we're moving on to um, our very last week, and I want to kind of do a lot in these two lectures, and uh, it might be a little bit much to take in, but I think I do that intentionally. Um, we end off our world history course in the present, in the modern day, and what I think you should be considering throughout both of these lectures is how can we take what we've learned over the past seven weeks and apply it to um, the modern day? And it'll become more apparent in the second lecture for week eight uh, what I mean by that. So let's just work our way through. Uh, our first driving question for um, this week is what is globalization uh, and to what extent is the global order, and I put that in quotes because, you know, it's debatable about what that is, uh, under threat today and uh, why does it matter? So in a lot of ways we pick up from where we left off um, with your response question uh, for week number seven where I asked you to explain how different the world was both politically and socially uh, in 1945 from 1914. And um, to give you kind of a synopsis of the best answers, you have to remember that in 1914, you still had this world dominated by European colonialism, right? The major powers on earth were Great Britain, France, uh, Germany, Russia, to a lesser extent, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, and the Ottoman Empire. But you had these new upstart powers too, the United States um, and Japan in particular. And uh, the Europeans had stretched their influence across uh, the entire world, Africa, Southeast Asia, the South Pacific. Uh, and when war came in 1914, a lot of men marched, you know, rather happily, you know, excitedly off to war. This is what they had read about from the 19th century, you know, France going to war with Germany, just like it had uh, in the 19th century. But by the time the dust had finally settled in 1945, um, I don't think anyone would have been happy to march off to war again. The horrors of atomic weapons, of genocide, really made kind of uh, another global conflict be uh, a terrifying idea. And importantly, that global balance, that, that world power balance had shifted dramatically. You know, Great Britain, France, um, Germany were not the major powers in the world anymore. There were two new powers, the United States and the USSR, uh, who were at odds with each other. And that's the Cold War. And we kind of talk a little bit about that uh, as we go in today. So we really pick up from where we left off uh, last week. Our, uh, you know, geographic scope today is the world, uh, and that's very important when we're discussing globalization. Obviously, we're talking about the globe, so keep that in mind. It's important to understand a couple of things, and I think that these are kind of um, themes that we've discussed throughout this semester. So the first is that exploitation is constant, right? Um, there is uh, forms of exploitation in, in our present world in the same way that there were forms of exploitation in um, the colonial world. You know, chattel slavery that existed in um, the colonization of the Americas is not the same, but bears striking similarities to modern day exploitation of children in factories in developing countries, especially in Southeast Asia and on the African continent, right? So exploitation hasn't gone away so much as it's changed forms. The industrial order has created a new form of exploitation. It's also important to remember that power is relative. Um, there's not kind of an infinite amount of power uh, to go around in our global world. As one nation, class, or group of people gains economic, political, or social power, another group loses it. Uh, for example, Native Americans beginning in 1492, in North America, Native Americans were dominant until the Europeans showed up. As the Europeans gained uh, both economic and uh, political power, social power, uh, the Native Americans lost it. Or Germany during the late 19th century, as the Germans became a unified group of people, France and Russia lost a tremendous amount of political and economic power in the European continent. So power is constantly relative. And uh, as my old advisor used to always say to historians, Things don't always get better. That is, historians like to tell a story about progress, uh, but oftentimes that progress is not linear, right? It's not a straight line. Sometimes things get better for a group of people for a while, only to get worse, and then to get better again, to get worse, to get better again, to get worse. Um, so things kind of um, can get worse for different groups of people, and tremendous gains can bring about 
tremendous amounts of suffering. My example here is, you know, Marxism promised uh, these groups of exploited people, that is working class people in, in the factories, offered them certain protections. Uh, but as we saw in Mao's great, great leap forward in China, uh, you know, the transition to communism killed more than 20 million people. So we have to kind of remember that there's promise and then there's sacrifice uh, and things don't always um, get better. So let's get to 1945. Uh, there's a really important, if we're talking economic change, there's a really important meeting that happens actually in New Hampshire of all places, in New Hampshire in the United States, a place called Bretton Woods. And what happened at Bretton Woods was the Allied powers, so the United Kingdom, um, the USSR, along with some nations from Eastern Europe, uh, France, Great Britain, they sat down uh, to discuss the new um, economic order of the world. And the result was um, the creation of something called, uh, two really important um, institutions, one called the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the other called the World Bank. Um, both of these establishments were products of Keynesian economics. If you want to read a little bit about Keynesian economics, I have that link there. I'll give you a brief explanation, but any of you who are economics business majors, finance, uh, it's interesting to realize you know, who uh, Keynes was because his um, influence is so great on the economic order of the post-war world. So John Maynard Keynes uh, believed that governments had an important role in the mitigation of depression, the regulation of the economy. Right, Keynes is big, uh, to you know, put it as simply as I can, Keynes's influence on economics, that is his big intervention, is he got rid of the idea of laissez-faire style of economics, right? Laissez-faire means to leave alone. Uh, and this was put forward uh, by Smith in his really kind of famous The Wealth of Nations, that government should do as little as possible to uh, mitigate the economy, because in Smith's ideology, when they do, they often kind of um, stagnate, they slow economic growth. But Keynes argued totally against this. Uh, Keynes basically pushed back on that classical idea by suggesting that supply does not create its own demand. Keynes wanted governments to take a very active role in stimulating, mitigating, and regulating business within their nations. Right? And you can see here kind of the beginnings of globalization, right? Keynes argued for things like tariffs, tax on imports and exports. Keynes argued for things like um, uh, the government subsidies of private companies, that is, government money that goes to private enterprises, right? Keynes was not a Marxist, that is, he didn't believe that all um, business should be owned by the government. Not at all. He believed that private business was critical to keeping um, ingenuity and keeping competition high, right? Ingenuity and competition keep the market thriving. But Keynes said that the government should provide subsidy, that is money, right? Given capital in order to keep uh, these businesses afloat and to help them thrive. So the government shouldn't just wash its hands of um, of the economy. Instead, it should take a pretty active role. And so this is what the IMF and the World Bank were created to do. Now, these are global institutions, meaning that um, not one nation controls the IMF or the World Bank. So what do these, um, in theory, what do these institutions do? Uh, well, if you're a member of the IMF, which as you can see, 184 member countries, so most of the nations on Earth are members of the IMF, um, the International Monetary Fund can lend money to help countries uh, fight poverty. Um, they can help them uh, fight uh, crisis prevention or inf inflation prevention. Remember World War I and what happened to Germany at the end where they faced this rampant inflation, ultimately leading to the rise of Hitler. Well, the IMF can lend money to help um, stop the creation of inflation. They can also fund um, development programs, you know, especially in developing nations, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. The IMF lends out a lot of money to build roads, to build hospitals, to build schools. Um, and so the IMF is a, a tremendous supporter of kind of internal growth, especially in uh, developing countries. The IMF also helps kind of a global uh, world in helping prevent a depression, like the one, again, that was created after the First World War. Uh, if there's kind of a crisis somewhere, the IMF can uh, contribute a tremendous amount of monies that's borrowed from its other member countries in order to mitigate that crisis to stop a more global uh, event from happening. Now, 
There are critics of the IMF, right? Uh, in particular, the IMF is dominated by the countries that give the most money to it. So it's perhaps unsurprising that probably the biggest contributor to the IMF is the United States. And so the United, United States has a tremendous amount of say in where IMF money goes. The IMF relies on the United States. And so if the United States is unhappy with how the IMF is spending its money, uh, it can threaten to give less to it. Uh, and so a lot of IMF projects have been, some critics would tell you, a uh, outreach of American global economic policy. There's also the United Nations. Remember, at the end of World War I, Woodrow Wilson argued for the League of Nations, which was created. The Europeans created a League of Nations after World War I in 1918. The United States didn't join it um, because they wanted to keep their neutrality. Uh, it ultimately failed, right? There was a Second World War. The uh, League of Nations was ultimately powerless. The United Nations created uh, shortly after the Second World War in order to prevent another global conflict like uh, the Second World War. And uh, thus far, you could argue, it's worked quite well. Uh, the UN is not really a military force, although it has exerted military um, intervention in places. Uh, in particular, the war in Korea was technically not an American war, but a, a UN conflict war. Um, the UN also um, has contributed troops uh, to Afghanistan and to the Middle East to fight ISIS. Uh, the UN also puts boots on the ground in Africa to fight uh, extremists, uh, in especially Eastern Africa. So the UN uh, does have a military branch, but ultimately really the UN is a political um, group of uh, assemblymen who uh, meet to discuss uh, important global political um, ongoings and political interests of different nations. There's also the creation of the European Union, which is perhaps, you know, if we're taking a European history course, a really interesting idea. Uh, you know, throughout this whole course, we've talked about the rivalry between either France and Britain or France and Germany, Russia and Germany. Um, but now there's the European Union, does not include Russia, uh, but does include France, Germany, uh, right now Great Britain, although Brexit is taking them out of it. Uh, and in 1993, the European Union was created uh, to create both economic and political integrated entity. So if you travel to Europe today, it's fascinating because say you land, uh, I just traveled this summer um, uh, to Europe and I landed in Amsterdam and landing in Amsterdam, you know, you get your passport checked. And then so long as you're traveling within uh, the European Union, so I traveled then to Paris and then Bordeaux and then down to Spain and to Madrid, I never had to have my passport checked again because technically, while I'm in the European Union nations, I'm only in one country. Um, so they work to kind of decrease barriers. And this has been incredibly uh, beneficial to their trade. Um, you probably know that the euro right now, their uh, monetary device, is worth more than uh, the American dollar. So uh, it's been incredibly beneficial for trade. But as we talk about a little bit in the next lecture, there are people who don't like the EU. There are people who don't like all of these things, these global orders, right? And that's what I'm referring to. The IMF, a global institution. The United Nations, a global institution. The European Union, maybe not global, but certainly at least pan-continental. Um, Globalization. It's difficult to define, but it's basically the process of linking the world's economic, I'm sorry, economies, religions, thought processes, even political systems into one integrated system. We live in a world that is very much, although not totally globalized, uh, that should say, I'll fix it, in every capacity. Uh, think about it. Small changes in oil production in Saudi Arabia can cause gas and energy prices to skyrocket across the world. These prices can lead to the downfall of economies and regimes. We live in a world that seems entirely integrated. Uh, and to show you this kind of image, you can kind of take a little bit of a note about it. Uh, even though we live in a global economy, there are, of course, major players, the United States being the largest of those major players, uh, but China being an important one, Japan, the United Kingdom, France, Germany. These economies and these uh, political institutions that control the economies create globalization. The United States cares very much what China is doing, especially today, read anything in the news, because how the Chinese economy uh, develops and the institutions that the Chinese government puts in to regulate its economy affect the United States, not just the economy, but what uh, everyday people can purchase and buy. So I'm going to stop there for lecture number one. I haven't totally gotten to the end of it. But what I want you to take away from this is think about how this globalized order is so much different from the world that existed prior, right? These new global institutions where there's cooperation between nations is something that we haven't talked about in this entire course.
When we go forward, we're going to see people who push back on that and why.